Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Reality Check with Charles Butler. We're broadcasting live here and uh, having a little fun. You know, it is always great to be with you. Uh, you can catch us. We are live here at uh, Red State Talk Radio and TalkStreamLive.com. Uh, we're also live out on uh, Facebook Live. Well, uh, this little cut in there. Okay. But uh, yeah, so we're just broadcasting live. We're getting ready to talk a little bit about um, Alexandria. Um, uh, Okasa. Uh oh. Something. Okay. Something's wrong with my little system today i don't know what is wrong with this thing it's it won't man it's always something i am really getting tired of this hey sorry yesterday folks that you could not hear my guest it that is the case you should dial me up at uh, 215-867-8255 that's top talk for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, our calling 215 top talk uh, we'll be out there. Uh, we'll take your call and get things squared away. You know, we it's usually a tweak here, a tweak there. Sometimes the gremlins jump in and, Welcome you know, kind of tweak the system. But, you know, we're trying to keep things on the up and up. And uh, uh, the host is here. So you can call me, 215-TOP-TALK. Ch uh, chime in. Give us your opinion. Love to hear from you. So, uh, you know, don't ever hesitate to give me a call. You know, the uh, Alexandria is, a, is an interesting person, Miss Alexandria Ocasa um, Cortez. She and Bernie Sanders yesterday went to Wichita, Kansas, two woo progressives in support of a congressional candidate named James Thompson. Bernie, you know, they, they pulled about 4,000 people. Well, you know, when President Trump shows up, they're like 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 people. Uh, and, you know, it's really interesting how they portray the crowd, right? You know, yesterday you would have thought there were 10,000 people in this arena. You know, they, and when Trump was in the same arena, they only focused on Donald Trump. They wouldn't show the crowd. The media is so biased. And this is the thing. I had a, had a talk with a dear friend of mine last night, a dear friend of mine whom, whom I've known for, over 30 years, I'm not going to tell you how many years over 30 years, but it could be 40. <laughs> uh, but I've known him over 30 years is where I'm going to stop. And I can tell you that uh, he's a great guy, uh, independent, open thinker. And he was telling me that, you know, he gets upset with Donald Trump's delivery. And I tell him that Donald Trump's not going to change his delivery. I don't have a problem with Donald Trump's delivery. I'm glad that Donald Trump is plain spoken, outspoken, and to the point. I like that. I tend to be that way myself. I don't like beating around the around the bush. And I and 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 let me be clear, I'm not a rude person, and I don't like rude people. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm a very nice guy. In fact, on my way into the studio this afternoon, I stopped to help a lady who had a huge, and I do mean huge, garment bag. It's on rollers. It was this wide. It was it was it, it was this wide, stuffed full of clothes, and this long and another bag on top of it about that size, and her purse, and a um, computer bag. And this stuff must weigh about, I would say, a good 100 pounds at least. And she was trying to get on the escalator, and I said, Miss, I think you should use the uh, elevator over there. And she thanked me profusely because she knew, and I could look in her eyes and tell that she really wasn't all that excited about jumping on the elevator with all of that gear and having to, to deal with it because uh, she was in the basement trying to, you know, maneuver these escalators. Well, really not the basement, but a second floor, and there were no bellhops there. So, um, but I'm a nice guy. You know, I help people all of the time. Man, I was out for lunch here in Chicago. I don't mean to change the subject, God. But I'm out for lunch in Chicago, and I go over to the Mariano's, and they're just gorgeous women everywhere, everywhere, all races, all shades, all hair colors, all sizes, just gorgeous. God bless America. We have some of the most beautiful women in the world. 
but I, you know, I'm, I'm a womanizer. I, I love all women. You know, I don't see many ugly women. I don't see ugliness in any women. Interesting. Hey, so look, getting back to this, uh, love fest down in, in, uh, Wichita, Kansas. I like Wichita, great people, great people down there, but, uh, Bernie Sanders and, uh, uh, Alexandria get up on, on stage and, and, uh, uh, Bernie says, Hey James, could I borrow your cowboy shoes? Not boots. Could I borrow your cowboy shoes? And, and Thompson was dressed in some denim jeans and some black boots. Right. And, um, uh, Thompson looked at him for a second and tried to recover from this hazing. Right. And he says, uh, I wear them because the S so deep around here. S uh, blank, 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 blank. I'm not going to say it on air. Even though I could, I will not. That's what I used to hate about Red State. I mean, I used to hate about uh, Genesis Communication. I had these guys with a high school education who were telling me what I could and couldn't say, like they were attorneys. And they were so wrong and so liberal. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was just a hassle. Anyway, I was there for five years. Anyway, throughout the uh, thick cement walls, of the downtown Wichita Convention Center. We heard a roar, or they heard a roar, of 4,000 uh, Kansans waiting uh, speeches from Sanders, uh, Thompson, and the progressive rocket ship, and some people call her a meteor. All these things connected with space. Some people call her the meteor, and then she's called a rocket ship, both of which are very fragile, you know, because when meteors hit the Earth's atmosphere what do they do dun, 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 dun. disintegrate <laughs> let me be clear they disintegrate so uh and uh rocket ships well what goes up must come down spinning wheel who was that uh three dog night was that three dog night i think that was uh going round. Mm, 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 you never learn. Oh, three. I think it was three dog night singing that. Right. A spinning pony. Anyway, man, we used to have some hellified songs. That was out of the 60s, man. The the Vietnam era. Spinning wheel. I think that's what the song was called. Spinning wheel. I love that song. But, you know, we had a lot of things going on back in those days. But anyway, so yesterday, yesterday, let's get back to yesterday. Yesterday, these people were down here trying to drum up whatever and uh blood sweat and tears did that blood sweat and tears like eli's coming eli's coming you better hide anyway i may be getting my groups mixed up but you know i know the music dang on it i know the music i know the lyrics that's for sure okay <laughs> um but uh so uh uh it was uh oh, i'm gonna call her Alexandria, for short, because I get tired of saying Ocastia Cortez. I get tired of these two hyphenated names. Uh, she's a so. This is a girl who's a bartender, okay? Uh, but like Gutierrez, who'd been a cab driver before he got elected to Congress, you know. I mean, these people, man, I tell you, uh, not too bright, and uh, definitely not good for the country. So. This was her first political appearance outside of New York. And um, they said after remarkable, you know, win in June, what was remarkable about it? What was remarkable was that the incumbent didn't get out and campaign and got, got uh, slapped. That's what happened. Anyway, um, they say that uh, she's never held office and she's tapped into similar, similar yearnings for a representative who has uh, more old friends at a local pub than in D.C. Right. Ooh, that's cold. But um, the choice of this location for her debut outside of New York is poetic, they say. Like Sanders, she and Thompson have refused corporate donations, and this district is the home, perhaps, of the greatest conservative influencers in the United States of America and in American history, the Koch brothers whose political network has pledged $400 million on conservative candidates before the midterms. They go on to say it's one thing to push the Democratic Party left in New York City. It's quite another 
to rabble rouse for universal health care, wind energy, and a livable wage in Charles Koch's backyard. Doing so, they, she, she goes on to say, takes my friends in the Northeast, they might say, chutzpah. I love that phrase, Yiddish phrase, chutzpah, meaning guts, balls, etc. So she goes on to say, as my uh, former, or as my gr former uh, farmer grandpa used to say, this is uh, Thompson, that gym is full of piss and vinegar. Wow. Um, they say that no other congressional de delegate, no other congressional candidate right now has ever done what Thompson is doing. And that's in an era of unrestricted corporate donations. This whole a progressive sword at the precise geographic heart of the dark money beast, the Koch brothers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's amazing. Well, you know, it's really humorous. Uh, and, you know, these people talk about the fight for America, the fight for civil rights, the fight for immigration. These aren't fights anymore, people. We have civil rights. We don't need more immigrants, either legal or illegal, unless they have some talent that some American just cannot acquire. And that is not probable. We have too many Asians, and I mean people from India specifically, in this country. And they don't assimilate, and they are not assimilating. Now, these same people have a lawsuit against Harvard because they think they're better than Americans. Their culture is better than Americans. And you people, especially you majority Americans, and you know who you are, <laughs> you refuse to stand up, man up for yourselves, for your children, for your communities, for your culture, for your tradition. America was made great, how? Four things. One common language. No, we're not a multi multicultural country. We're Americans, damn it. But we have one language. Yeah, we don't speak French. We don't speak Spanglish. We don't speak Spanish. We don't speak Italian. We speak American. <laughs> the second thing that made us great was one currency. Same thing Europe is trying to do. They wanted to flip to the euro. Well, I kind of like going to Europe because, you know, you fly into London, you dealt with the pound, you dealt with shillings, you dealt with, you know, their currency. And then you fly to um, France and you deal with the franc. Then you fly to Italy and you do some exchange, some swap and whatever the hell they had. You had a pocket full of money because their money was always so cheap. Then you go to Germany and you had to ditch mark. You know, you go to Sweden and you had the Swiss franc, yada, yada. Now they're all on this thing called the euro, except for who? Great Britain. We knew that Great Britain was going to eventually leave. They never switched their currency. They never totally joined the EU because they knew how crazy Europeans tend to be. And I'm not even going to go into Turkey and that whole mess over there with Erdogan. That was a big mistake to allow this Muslim nation into the EU the EU, which is bringing all these Muslims in to the rest of Europe. But we're going to stop right there. I'm not going to go down that pathway. We're going to stay on what made America great. And you got this girl, Alexa, uh, Alexandria, saying to us that, I'm not sure. Alexa, stop. <laughs> that my Alexa thought I was talking to her when I said Alexandria. So uh, the issue is what made America great? Four things, I always say. One language, English. One currency, the dollar. One set of laws, the, uh, actually five things, one set of laws, the Constitution. Uh, we're a Judeo-Christian nation, and we're Americans. A-M-E-R-I-C-A-N-S, Americans. And that means something. These Indians who come here, they're Indian. They're not interested in being American. They're not interested in assimilating. That's who they are. And there are millions of them. There are millions of them. America, wake up. You know, it was an interesting article in, I think it was Wall Street Journal, one of these journals I read today, one of these papers I read today, about um, 
fertilization. Oh, where was that article? Maybe it was Washington Examiner. It was a great article, great article. The fight for America. Like I said, there are five things that made America great. Four, I changed it to five. Added Judeo-Christian in there. We're, we're all Americans of that Judeo-Christian background and faith. And why? Because it's what brought us to where we are today. A belief in God, Yahweh. You know, I know Jews don't believe in Jesus. They believe, we believe in the same God. They have the Old Testament. We have the New Testament. They, you know, yada, 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 yada. Okay. So. Religion is religion. You have to excuse that noise in the background, but we are going under construction in this area and in this building, and it is horrendous. I'm just glad it doesn't happen early in the morning or late at night. Um, the fight for America, a history, a hard history, comes with hard language, says this article. During a period, this article appears in The Guardian, by the way. Since during a period of homelessness, Thompson bathed, washed clothes, and fished for food in a canal. He fought for the emancipation from an abusive parent and attended 16 schools before finishing high school. This is not a man who, in the face of rising authoritarianism, will be civil to please pearl-clutching political leaders on either side of the aisle. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm happy for him. I'm happy that he was able to use what we call America to pull himself up, to get himself together, to attend college and move on with his life. They, he, he, this reporter says that Thompson told him that he first he was first encouraged to run for office by Republican friends who felt out of sync with a party morphing into insanely into an insanely right caricature a pro-choice, gun-owning military veteran who supports legal weed and social security expansion. Thompson can kick dirt with farmers at rural events, walk in Wichita's recent gay parade and Juneteenth parades. The gay parade is, they said parade here, but they, they're talking gay parade. And Juneteenth is, uh, you know, this um, celebration of when blacks in, uh, Texas learned that they were free. That was Juneteenth. And, it, and the emancipation, I guess, it happened in February. Uh, and post a photo of himself smiling with two guys wearing <laughs> bearded, deplorable shirts after a long conversation about the issues. Um, they go on to say that he nearly won a special election last year. And now uh, Ocasio-Cortez and Sanders, who won the Kansas Democratic Caucus for 2016, um, two to one against Hillary, they're here to make sure that he gets it done in the midterms by flipping this district blue for the first time in 26 years. Well, I doubt if that really will happen because this guy sounds more like Trump to me than he does like Bernie Sanders or Orizio Cortez or Cassio Cortez. He really does. Trump is truly a radical. He's a radical individual, totally radical. And uh, this guy does not seem like he uh, is a Bernie supporter or a Ocasio-Cortez supporter. But um, they go on to say in the article, as I kind of scroll down here, um, or, or Ocasio-Cortez says this. Uh, after campaigning all day for Mr. Thompson. She says that, that um, when someone actually knocks on your door or goes to your civic association meeting and you actually touch their hand, it really does change everything. Um, and they tweeted uh, a picture of her, uh, her shoes that she wore door to door, holes worn through the soles with the comment, respect the hustle. I love this girl. I don't think she's going to win because of her uh, 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 liberal, you know, district, unless the Democrats sabotage, sabotage her, which they're known to do now. They're known to do. Um, so we'll see. Old Bernie, you have pictures of Bernie in here. And these pictures, man, I tell you, show this balding head. He looks like a friar tuck kind of guy. He's got a big ball patch and hair down here. You know, I mean, 
how does this guy, when he claims he marched with Martin Luther King, that was a lie. You know, he attended a meeting where he was stoned. He attended a, uh, a march where he was stoned out of his mind getting that free pot. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha, Bernie. So, social media, this guy Thompson is supposed to be doing pretty well. He says, show up or shut up with no response. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, Ocasio Ortez, uh, when, when she was in the fifth grade, this guy, uh, her teacher said that, um, who was a Kansas native with a fierce love for uh, her home state, the young Cortez was nervous. She told a Wichita audience when the teacher organized a state history project and assigned her Kansas. After reading a lot about wheat as a 10 year old, I learned that Kansas was founded in a struggle over the conscience of the nation. Yeah. The conscience like slavery, slavery. That's what Kansas was found on, founded on the, the Kansas Nebraska act of uh, 1854. Dred Scott was connected to all that. I mean, it was, it, it, was, it was real crazy, real, real crazy. In the Supreme Court that same year um, uh, basically took away black Americans' citizenship, people of African descent. Uh, the Supreme Court said we're not citizens of the United States. Court crazy. Where they had been considered citizens before. But... Um, the, and for those of you who don't know, the Kansas Nebraska Act of 54 uh, was charged uh, territory. Kansas, they had, you know, the slavery laws. They had the Missouri Compromise. There's a whole bunch of things surrounding slavery in those states, in Kansas and Nebraska, uh, Missouri, Arkansas. Arkansas was a slave state, of course. But uh, abolitionists fought, you know, bloody battles uh, and bloody um, uh, border wars with their neighboring slave holding Missouri and um, sparking the Civil War. And Kansas was established as a free state. In fact, uh, members of the Union uh, fought Kansas uh, militia, fought for the Union during the, the uh, Civil War. I've run across, you know, Kansas regiments numerous times in, in historic battles in the Civil War. But uh, you know, this article runs on and on and on, but the point I was making and I'd like to make is that they're not giving Kansas up. They're going in to try to take Kansas. They're going to try to take some uh, blue areas, some blue districts, and I mean some red districts and turn them blue. Is that possible? Well, we'll see. But, you know, at the end of the day, I can only say this, folks. It is what it is because we uh, are always looking at the positive side. We're always looking for the good in people and uh, the good in the country. So um, we're going to take a little break and we'll be right back. The reality check with Charles Butler here on Red State, a talk, a radio.
Welcome back to The Reality Check with Charles Butler. Yeah, we talked a little bit about uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders teaming up. That is interesting. That's always interesting to me. Always interesting to me, those two. They are a, a, a pair. Well, how about that Donald Trump, huh? How about that Donald Trump negotiating uh, an end of tariffs with the EU? So now we don't have to worry about 20% being tacked onto our BMWs, our Mercedes Benz, our um, Fiat's, our <laughs> European made cars. And the cheese, we don't have to worry about our cheese being, prices on our cheese being jacked up. Oh, or our wines, the wines from France, the wines from Italy, or the whiskeys from the UK. How about that? Now, I'm a brown whiskey guy myself. You know, I'm Jack Daniels, uh, Kentucky sipping whiskey. That's me. I love a little wine, though. I'm, you know, I love red or white, probably red more than white, uh, because I like that full body flavor when I'm smoking a cigar. Speaking of which, I haven't had many lately, many cigars, that is. But Donald Trump and Yonker, you know, Yonker, before this, this meeting yesterday, Yonker was talking all this trash. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell Donald Trump, you know, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind and tell him that these, these uh, tariffs just won't work. And, and, uh, and if he decides to go forward with the tariffs, then, you know, we'll retaliate. He was talking a whole bunch of trash. And, you know, he got over here and he did what he was supposed to do. You know, uh, and that was be a good diplomat, be a good president of the EU. Can you imagine that? Here's one man who represents 13 countries, one dude, 13 countries. And guess what? One of those countries has already said, we're out of here. We got eight months, baby. We're out of here. That's the Brexit, the British exit. We're gone, out, kaput, see ya. Dead work for us. But here is this one guy, Mr. Yonker, who, um, Jean-Claude, Jean-Claude Yonker, who decided that, you know, guess what? <laughs> I'm going to run, uh, I'm going to go over and give Donald Trump a piece of my mind. Well, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. And they agreed to hold off on any further tariffs as they try to work out the take to taking down all the barriers. Now, if Donald Trump succeeds in this, I mean, let's look at Trump's accomplishments, okay? He's rolled back Obamacare. Uh, this year, this month, according to my good friend C. Stephen Tucker over at uh, healthcarementors.com. Stephen, I'm giving you a little play here, a little free advertisement. Uh, said that you'll be able to put together organizations like you people out there who are painters or who are construction workers or who are uh, computer geeks. You can get together and put together your own organization. See, I used to have to design this kind of stuff for people. You know, I'd go up, if you need Blue Cross, you know, three members or three people make a group and therefore your pre existing situations go away, yada, yada, yada. Now, a lot of folks, we didn't have, you know, internet. We didn't have, you know, you could go online and put your corporation together in 30 minutes. We didn't have that kind of stuff in those days. So it was a little bit more difficult for people to sit down and wrap their mind around what I was trying to do for them and what I did do for them and what I told them. Uh, now, the Trump administration is making it easier for small business owners to form uh, associations and get group pricing and group uh, benefits uh, that uh, that group insurance brings, which is, you know, uh, eliminating the pre-existing conditions and things like that. But these insurance companies, I'm telling you, man, they made a lot of money. Their stock, the, the, the average stock, no, let me, let me repeat. I'm backing up because I'm telling a lie. The lowest Earning stock when Barack Obama left office, health insurance stock when Barack Obama left office, had increased 126%. Some stocks had increased 148%. Some stocks 
These healthcare executives, health insurance executives made a buku bank under Barack Obama. So don't think that Barack was a socialist. He was a capitalist for his friends. So we're going to hold off uh, on any further tariffs. And uh, Donald Trump and uh, Jean-Claude <laughs> announced in the Rose Garden yesterday that they would, they would ag agree, they agreed to begin discussions to eliminate tariffs and subsidies that hampered trade across the Atlantic and to resolve the steel and aluminum tariffs. The Trump administration had uh, imposed earlier this year and was getting ready to impose some more. Well, you know, they're, they're coming, the other tariffs, as well as retaliatory tariffs that the European Union imposed in response. Wow, this is great. This is great. The EU will be buying more liquefied natural gas and soybeans from the U.S., and the two sides would begin a dialogue to reduce the differences on regulatory standards between the two economies. I love it. See, China's going to have to do the same thing because at the end of the day, guess what? China is an export economy, just like Japan. You remember when Japan was held up and we talked about how great the Japanese economy was and how intelligent the, uh, the Chinese people were and how unintelligent Americans are. And, oh, man, it was, it was brutal. We took a beating. We took a big beating from our friends and enemies. <laughs> but... We survived. Now the Japanese economy is in the tank, and they can't seem to get it right about anything. Why? Because we moved all that manufacturing. We moved all of those uh, prized relationships and trade agreements to China. Okay? <laughs> so Japan's out in the cold, and their economy's been in the tank ever since. When we move those jobs from China back to America, China's economy is going to tank too. Yes, China economy is going to tank. In fact, as I go through the paper, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the Wall Street Journal, it is full. Remember I told you yesterday about above the fold versus being below the fold. Above the fold meaning uh, uh, top of the line, news story, uh, you know, this is what everybody's talking about or should be talking about. First story was, of course, we just did that or part of it, is uh, the U.S.-Europe calls for a truce on trade. The next story is uh, China tensions torpedo the chip deal. What chip deal? Those of you who are out there looking at stocks know what chip deal. The Qualcomm deal with uh, the Dutch chip maker uh, uh, N NXF, NXF, and uh, they were a semiconductor company out of um, the, ne the Netherlands. Well, <laughs> the, the deal makers could not get a approval in China. And they made the deal just undoable because um, they said one of the most prominent victims of the spiraling U.S.-China trade uh, tension and the derailing of a central part of the U.S. chip giant strategy, China was the last of nine markets that needed to approve the deal, and they didn't. See, they're trying to, you know, twist that knife in a little bit, but it won't work because, you know, Qualcomm doesn't need to buy this chip maker anyway. They just want to get bigger, and the chip maker's a competitor. Uh, here we have an article above the line. And, you know, I don't want chips made in China. In fact, uh, you know, we have some issues with chips made in China and, and defense contractors who've made micro con, microchips and microprocessors uh, in China and install these things in our most sensitive weapon systems. Da, da, da. Amazing. Amazing. When you talk about treason, that could be considered treason. Treason for profit. But because it's all done under the auspices of making profit, somehow there's some loopholes that don't allow us to charge these defense contractors with what? 
treason because they're just trying to make more profit for their shareholders. <laughs> we are a country that's going to face a serious decline if we don't gather our moral compass. And why do I say that? Because when I look at America, this is not the America that I grew up with. This is not the America that I grew up loving and worshiping and wanting to be an adult and wanting to be a, a progressive, uh, a productive, a progressive, I'm sorry, productive student or a productive citizen in and raising children to be productive citizens in. We are a society that has gone astray, astray from our moral obligations, away from God, away from right and wrong, away from uh, achieving and striving to do your best to do the right thing. There is no right. There is no wrong. There are no boys. There are no girls. There are no winners. There are no losers. Well, how can you run a society like that? You can't. It's all chaos. It's Saul Alinsky. It's Barack Obama. It's Hillary Clinton. These are not good people. You don't hear these people talk about these folks this way because most of the pundits that we deal with aren't that smart. They really aren't that smart that are on TV. I'll tell you one of the smarter ones, and sometimes she gets a little whack, and that's Laura Ingram. I think Laura is a smart person, smart person. I can't say that much for some of the other hosts. Uh, on that network or other networks. I just don't see that many smart people on those networks. I mean, you listen to their commentary. It's kind of whack at best. The, Mike, my, my, oh, 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 I read right before I came on, Zuckerberg was losing something like 16 billion a day, personal net worth, net worth or something like that. 16 billion a day he was losing. Let me Google that because that was fascinating. I just didn't have a lot of time to focus on it because, you know, I don't like Zuckerberg. He's a guy who says he's, he's more important than Ginsburg. You know, my, you know, Facebook, you know, is more important than, than, than Ginsburg. I mean, where did he get that from? Here's a guy who didn't finish college and he, well, here he goes. Mark Zuckerberg loses $16 billion in one day as Facebook stocks plummet 20%. People are calling for his head. Take it. Lop it right off. Let's do a little French Revolution here. <laughs> oh, just kidding, people. Just kidding. But, um, wow. Uh, you know, I was thinking about or did you see yesterday? I, and I tweeted about this. By the way, folks, we are live. We are live uh, right here on Red State Talk Radio from uh, 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. every day. RedStateTalkRadio.com and TalkStreamLive.com. Uh, the, the, did you see by any chance, and I, yeah, like I said, I tweeted about this and Facebooked about this yesterday. Uh, the, con uh, the Senate, uh, trying to question uh, Mike Pompeo, <laughs> our Secretary of State. I love Pompeo, man. He he just lambasted the right back. I mean, they were rude. They were crude. And Mike just hung in there and got his zingers in, right? Because there was one uh, senator who just lied. He, he, he cited all of these lies on Donald Trump. And Pompeo wouldn't let him get away with it. He, he, you know, he, you know, uh, he just wouldn't let him get away with it. I'm, I'm going to say the, the the Senate hearing and see what comes up. I put in here Trump. I really didn't mean to do that, but that's what they were trying to get to. They were trying to get well. You know, Trump just gave away everything to Vladimir Putin. Do you know what happened in the meeting, uh, Mr. Secretary? And Mike was cool. He was like, uh, I think the proof of President Trump's actions are, uh, you can look at his actions against Russia if you think that they're treasonous, the, the enforcement of sanctions, which Barack Obama didn't do, didn't have the heart, didn't have the guts to do, because he's a girly man. Uh, and Pompeo was just zinging him left and right. And it, they couldn't handle it. I, I was cracking up because, and I stopped. I mean, I stopped and sat there and watched the, these people uh, lie on President Trump. 
and say that Trump said this and Trump said that. And nothing could have been further from the truth. Nothing could have been uh, further from the truth. So they uh, wanted to talk about Russian interference and, and the president looking like a looking weak when he stood up with Vladimir Putin. And that wasn't true. If anyone looked weak standing next to, Vla to Vladimir Putin, look at Obama. He looks like a deer in, 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 in uh, headlights, you know, and these people, these lying media, news media here in America, so he stands up, he, he stands up, he looks uh, Putin in the eyes. That's what the president heard yesterday in the Oval Office. These people had no respect, absolutely no respect for the president. And so the president barred one of the CNN reporters. And then you get the, the Lou Dobbs of the world <laughs> saying that he supports, um, what did Lou say? How did Lou say that? Let's see, what did Lou say? Uh, that he supported what did Lou say? I'm trying to figure it out because I don't want to lie on Lou Dobbs. That's one of the last people I want to lie on. But Lou said, uh, who the hell is the White House to, to ban uh, a reporter? But this is the, the, the kind of gaggle that went on that it was... It was crazy. It was crazy. And she didn't stop. They tried to stop her. She wouldn't stop. So um, Lou Dobbs comes on last night, and he said he supports the White House decision to ban a uh, CNN reporter from a press event for asking Trump questions earlier that day. His comments came shortly after uh, Fox News president Jay Wallace and his uh, network stay, said stands in strong solidarity with CNN. That's interesting. So you have, so you have uh, the president of CNN, a guy named Jay Wallace. Now he took um, Bill Shine's spot. <sighs> Boy. And um, he said that we stand with CNN, that, you know. So Dobbs says, my question is, who the hell are they? Dobbs said after reading CNN's statement about the ban, the president does insist on respect. Wow. The press secretary, the White House press secretary anyway, Sandra Huckabee Sanders said in a statement that the White House barred one of CNN's reporters uh, Caitlin Collins from a press availability in the Rose Garden because she shouted questions and refused to leave despite repeatedly being asked to do so during Trump's meeting with the EU Commissioner President, the EU Commission President, I'm sorry, John Claude Yonker earlier that day. Wow. They, they go on to say, and, D and Dobbs went on to say, he said, it, it's about time. There were consequences for disrespectful behavior in the White House. So let's hear from Lou himself.
hey, see, these people bent over backwards kissing Barack Obama's boots. When Barack Obama said on open mic, and I'll play the clip later, you know, somebody calls in and asks for it, I'll play it for you. He said, hey, I um, tell Vladimir that I will be more flexible after I, after the election. So, uh, you know, after Lou Dobbs says what he says about, you know, the, there should be more respect uh, for the president uh, and by these newscasters. Um, what happened? He says there should be more respect. Uh, come on, Charles, what happened? What happened? What happened? So, uh, Brett Baer, Brett Baer earlier had reiterated that Fox News supports CNN uh, for following uh, Collins' ban. And uh, Bear went on to say, Brett Bear of Fox says, as a member of the White House press pool, Fox stands firmly with CNN on the issue of access. Well, but Lou Dobbs has assumed an adversarial stance against his Fox News colleagues before. And last week, as Fox reporters called out uh, President Trump for his conduct uh, during a joint press conference with uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin and Holinsky, Dobbs said he thought the president handled himself perfectly. I have said the same thing. You know, everybody, he was a wuss. He was a wimp. No, he wasn't. He was very succinct. He was very polite. He wasn't supposed to be disrespectful to the Russian president. They're trying to cut deals and get along, not sh not do one-upsmanship. Barack Obama was terrified of Vladimir Putin. Let me repeat, terrified. If you don't believe me, go look at the pictures of Barack Obama standing with Vladimir. I thought the guy was going to jump out of his skin. He's a girly man. He's a sissy. And he knows that Vladimir knows he's a sissy. I mean, Barack is a real sissy. I'm not talking about uh, uh, figuratively. I mean, the guy's literally a sissy. He's a sissy boy. You know, in the Philippines, they call them Benny boys. And where Barack is, is from, they call them Benny boys. And it's very common and accepted in the Philippines and in Indonesia for Benny boys to exist. Barack is built like one. And I'm not going to go into all that. But, you know, I mean, that's what it is. Look at it. Look it up. Don't take my word for it. I always tell people, don't take my word for, you know, don't take me literally what I say. Go look it up. You disagree? Go look it up. You know, he said, Charles is being uh, unfair. He's being, go look it up. You know, don't give me a hard time because I'm telling you the truth. I, what I do here, the reality check, the reality check. I'm giving it to you for real, okay? Whether it's Wall Street Journal, whether it's The Guardian, whether it's New York Times, we look at these things from a bigger perspective than the reporter or than the columnist or than the opinion that's put out there. But I said, and I agree with Lou Dobbs, that President Trump handled himself very well with Vladimir Putin. And Dobbs went on to say, what would it have taken to satisfy the morons on those clips? What would it have taken to satisfy the morons on those clips? That's what Lou Dobbs said. I said the same thing. <laughs> But, you know, the president has faced very intense bipartisan backlash because he, the, the same people who are accusing Trump of being a wimp have never said anything to Vladimir Putin, refused to address the issues of Vladimir Putin. And they keep on talking about, well, Trump, has he played down the Russian interference? No, they just didn't make it an issue. Because, you know, it, 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 let me reiterate again, we... The United States of America have been very actively, I want to repeat, actively involved in elections, selecting governments, selecting the forms of government. What was Vietnam about? Vietnam was about propping up a half-ass Christian so-called Democrat government against whom? The Buddhist, a Buddhist government a Buddhist-controlled government that really wasn't leaning to communism or socialism. They just wanted to, to, to eat. The French had gone in there, as most 
imperialists do, as most col colonists, uh, uh, colonizers do, uh, rape the country, rape the women. That's what, you know, you know uh, the um, imperialists did. I mean, Belgium owned the Congo. The Belgian Congo was probably 20 times bigger. It's more than that. I forget how many times bigger the Congo was than the country of Belgium. The Belgium Congo. And these people were oppressing, suppressing, enslaving the Congolese people. <laughs> then you had the, the, you had the, the, the uh, French, uh, Belgian Congo, and you had the, the, the Germans had, had um, before World War I, had colonies in Africa. Man, I tell you. Those those Europeans, man, they 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 cut Africa up and they hung together with each other. We're not even going to talk about the opium wars and the boxer wars and those things. That puts a new light on Great Britain. <laughs> not so favorable because they pushed uh, opium use uh, in the boxer wars. But um, anyway. You know, I, I, I'm having a problem with something, and uh, this is how we're going to end the show on this, this one note. I'm having a problem with the attorney-client privilege clauses, laws, whatever you want to call them, that exist or are supposed to exist. So now if I sit down with my attorney and I share with my attorney – things that I don't want anyone else to know, the government can come in and seize those conversations, notes from those conversations and use them against me. What kind of craziness is that? So, 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 so a client tells a, a, an attorney what really happened in an instance. Now this attorney is supposed to defend him, whether you know, he takes a murder case, you know, the guy's innocent or guilty. You know, guys will say, well, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm innocent. But he tells the attorney, well, you know, yeah, you know, I accidentally pushed the person down, didn't expect them to die. And they build a case around this, right? So now the government can come in and seize, the prosecutor can come in and seize your notes, seize your records, and say, well, you know, Your Honor, this is what they really meant right here. I mean, uh, uh, the, the client told the attorney that he, he really pushed the victim down and the victim died, but he didn't intend to do so. Is that involuntary manslaughter? Is that what we're going after now? But he pleaded guilty to pushing this person down. <laughs> Man, we're going down a slippery slope. Mueller, the Democrats, Republicans, we need to get back to the Constitution. We need to get back to the rule of law. And that's why I look forward. I look forward to having Justice Kavanaugh come aboard this um, court because I think he's a stand-up, first-class guy. Uh, anyway, we're signing off over on Red State and Talk Stream Live. We'll be back tomorrow. Uh, doing our thing, but I'm going to stay on a little longer on the Facebook Live and finish up. Cohen says prosecutors examine Cohen's tabloid ties. Now, they donate literally, let's see, uh, A10. I think they donate something like three quarters of a page to, <laughs> I was reading, <laughs> yeah, yeah, three quarters of a page. This is all the stuff on Michael Cohen from that lead article from up, up here all the way down here about his ties to tabloids. The whole page is called In Death. The whole page is donated to Michael Cohen. He taped a conversation with the reporter. That was with um, Stephanopoulos, I think. I think, let's see, Chris. Oh, no, Chris Como. Chris Cuomo of CNN, he, he taped that conversation. But, uh, man, you can't make this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. Uh, but he has a long history of, you know, doing work with tabloids. And it's all captured right here.
right here, right here in the Wall Street Journal. We should pick up a copy. Check it out. I think you'd, you'd appreciate it. You'd enjoy it. The reality and the reality check. I'm going to go over here to, uh, let's see, my, my old favorite haunt, the New York Times. They say that Mueller is looking at Trump's tweets in an obstruction investigation. <laughs> they can't find anything on Trump. So now it's an obstruction investigation. It was supposed to be about the Russians meddling in the election. Now it's, is he obstructing the uh, investigation by tweeting? This is what this article actually says. I'm not going to lie to you. And it is, it is laughable. And they and they go and they go here and the, and the two, um, the two authors, a guy named um, Michael Schmidt and Maggie Haberman. Uh, it starts out uh, for years. President Trump has used his Twitter as his uh, go to the public relations weapon, mounting a barrage of attacks on celebrities and then political rivals, even after advisors warned he could be creating legal problems for himself. The concerns now turn out to be well-founded. Special counsel Robert Mueller is scrutinizing tweets and negative statements from the president about General Attorney Sessions and the former FBI director, James Comey, according to three people briefed on the matter. Several other remarks came as Mr. Trump was so privately pressuring the men, both key witnesses in the inquiry, about the investigation, and Mr. Mueller is investing what investigating or examining whether the actions add up to attempts to obstruct the investigation by both intimidating witnesses and pressuring senior law enforcement officials to tamp down the inquiry. No, he's trying to get to the bottom of it. Said, "Hey, it, James Comey, if I'm not the target." of the investigation on uh, Russian collusion, you telling me this, but tell the public. That's what he said to Comey. That's one of the things I remember saying to Comey. Anyway, and then they want to talk about, you know, they make up all of these weird scenarios. Well, Donald Trump can pardon himself, uh, you know, because he's president. <laughs> well, could Dick Nixon have pardoned himself? Could he have pardoned, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, shoot, uh, the guy who went to jail. There's several. And I'm looking at the guy. I did his radio show a number of years ago. Let's see, Watergate, Watergate, Watergate. Uh, Watergate jailed. Let's see. Lee, G. Gordon Liddy, that was his name. G. Gordon Liddy. Uh, he went to jail. Uh, James McCord, he went to jail. Uh, let's see, who else went to jail? Oh, yeah, Nixon's chief of staff went to jail. John Dean went to jail. And with his blabber mouth, John Mitchell went to jail. Uh, Howard Hunt, uh, uh, Charles Colson, who became a an evangelist when he got out. Oh, man, yeah, it was several. So um, we had um, Agnew resign, Nixon resign, 40 government officials were indicted or jailed. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. But anyway, we'll see where this investigation goes with uh, Mr. Mueller looking into obstruction by Donald Trump. So you have uh, four major players here. You got Trump, Comey, Sessions, and Mueller. Well, we'll see what, what happens. And then you, you throw in uh, Cohen as an informant, and you take his notes, and you take the client, the attorney-client privilege away. And what do we have? Maybe a conviction? I doubt it. But we have a lot of embarrassment, uh, aggrandizement, and uh, grandstanding on the American people's, on the taxpayers' dime. I'm tired of it. Wrap up the investigation, Mr. Mueller. Wrap it up. <laughs> well, I'm not going to go there. But anyway, 
wrap it up, Mr. Mueller, wrap it up. Anyway, look, we're going to um, uh, sign off on the um, discussion. Uh, the, the um, uh, what is it? The, the Facebook out here, the Facebook Live, we're going to take it and uh, bag it and uh, hope you enjoy it. Pass it around to your friends, share it, like it, and uh, let's get it out there. You can also go over to YouTube and pick up a copy of the, um, or download a copy of the, the video and the audio, okay? So I'm going to end this session today, and we will be back tomorrow doing our thing, doing our thing. So tune in. And uh, we'll probably have Dr. Bonacohen with us, okay?